about some of the changes at The Guardian. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A, but she's going to really talk about The Guardian and finding a purpose and obviously a little bit about the membership model. So Catherine, I'm going to ask you to come out and share some of your wisdom with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you very much to the Global Editors Network for inviting me to speak. It's wonderful to be here in uh, beautiful Athens. And at a time when journalism can feel like it's under attack from authoritarian leaders imprisoning reporters or dismissing powerful reporting as fake news, to algorithms whose owners disown responsibility for the harm their products can cause, it's great to be here with colleagues who share a love of finding out the facts holding the powerful to account, informing the public and getting to the truth. At The Guardian, we've always recognized the power that comes from cooperation across borders. That applies to our collaborations with other news organizations and we have worked with many publications also represented at this summit. And it also applies to our relationship with Europe. We have always been and always will be a pro-European news organization. Of course, we've never been uncritical of the EU, its institutions, or its politicians. And by the way, we never thought the Euro was a good thing to belong to. We understand the fallout from the crisis in Greece. And on that point, it's wonderful to be in a room with representatives of three of the only companies in the world that realistically could pay off Greece's debt. But the idea of Europe, its motivating ideals, and the common cultural and social bonds that we all enjoy are fundamental to The Guardian and our sister Sunday newspaper, The Observer. When I originally agreed to speak today, I expected the UK might already have left the European Union on March 31st, as scheduled. I suspect any editor who's ever found themselves extending deadlines again and again for a difficult foreign correspondent feels some sympathy for the EU. As we go on with the debate on the future of Europe, both in the UK and across the continent, The Guardian will always seek to report on Europe, from Europe, and to Europe, giving Europe a perspective on the UK and the rest of the world via our international reporting from our US and Australia editions. In fact, we've noticed for some time a great deal of interest in The Guardian coming from all over Europe, especially in recent months. Traffic from the EU27 to our platforms has hit record levels, including four and a half million browsers from Greece. And we have a growing number of European readers who choose to help fund us as supporters. So despite Brexit, Europe matters more to the Guardian than ever. Today I want to talk about the tumultuous times in which we live, the role for the media in responding to these times, and how we at the Guardian have responded both journalistically and through our business model. I have to warn you, the speech uh, begins in quite a bleak way, uh, but it gets cheerier, I promise. So we're living through an extraordinary moment in history, and indeed an extraordinary year when a 16-year-old from Sweden, Greta Thunberg, shows the kind of political and moral leadership many of us long for. The world today is a more confusing, contested place in living memory. Scientists in the UN tell us that we have just 11 years to prevent a catastrophic climate change. The biomass of wild animals has fallen by 82% and a million species are at risk of extinction, according to the global, UN Global Assessment Report published uh, in May. Without government help, it's hard to know how to stop it. Meanwhile, the excesses of capitalism have fostered huge inequality, division and resentment. Technology is dramatically shifting how we live, in sometimes enriching, but often remote and unaccountable ways. These huge global changes have helped to destabilize national politics around the world, from Bolsonaro to Erdogan, Salvini to Trump to Brexit. At the same time, we face a widespread collapse of civic life, with public spaces sold off, vital services starved of funding. And there's a new chronic homelessness crisis in the UK, just as there is in many other rich countries. The Guardian even revealed recently that London playgrounds were being segregated between children from richer and poorer families based on what type of housing their parents could afford. It's no wonder that our lives have become increasingly atomized with depression and loneliness rising fast. 
But we know that people long to help each other, to share experiences, to be part of a community, to have influence over their lives. When John Harris, a Guardian writer, made his most recent Anywhere But Westminster documentaries around the country, there were places, both urban and rural, rich and poor, he kept hearing the same phrases from the public. Phrases like, nothing is solid, and we've lost control. Whether young or old, in cities or towns, pro-Brexit or pro-Remain, people feel betrayed, undermined, powerless. And we see the same mood across Europe and the world. And it's not hard to imagine how this has produced the tide of resentment that has shaken our politics with a desire to belong just as easily finding a home in dark places. Nationalist and right-wing populists did not sweep the European elections across the continent, as some had predicted, but they still made alarming gains and are undoubtedly shifting the debate. So in these disorientating times, championing the public interest has become an urgent necessity for the media. With that in mind, I wrote an essay last year about the Guardian's role in our readers' lives. There was a moment when I read a copy of the Guardian in print, um, outlining all of these crises I mentioned at every level. All this doom, and I thought we have to do more for our readers than this. The, the, the newspapers and the news, uh, websites we publish can't just be one huge howl of pain. I thought we have to give our readers some hope. But I was worried about using the word hope uh, with journalists. It's, um, yeah, as we know, journalists are a cynical uh, crowd. And um, the idea of a kind of sunny optimism uh, seemed like the wrong idea. But as I read about hope, I realized that Hope is actually, it's not optimism, it's not banal. It's an incredibly serious engagement with the world. It's an understanding of the world, it's an aim to contextualize the world, and it's a belief that we still have the power to make the world a better place. It's the anti-powerlessness idea, is hope. Um, and I read, I'm sure you know Rebecca Solnit, she wrote this brilliant book, Hope in the Dark. And she said that to, uh, authentic hope requires clarity and imagination. And I thought, well, I can't think of two better concepts for a news organization like The Guardian at a time like this than clarity and imagination. So I think the, the, guard, the role of The Guardian is this. If people long to understand the world, then we must provide them with clarity, facts they can trust, information that they need, reported and written and edited with care and precision. And if people long to create a better world, then we must use our platform to nurture imagination hopeful ideas, fresh alternatives, a belief that the way things are isn't the way things need to be. So to do that, I lay out five principles for Guardian journalism. First of all, we must develop ideas, not just critiques. So the Guardian will always embrace progressive policies and ideas, it's who we are. But in an age of filter bubbles and hyper-partisan politics, we must also make space for different ideas and diverse opinions. That means we'll run new ideas and conflicting ideas and well-argued pieces from across the political spectrum, even if we disagree with them. And we'll also make the space for fresh ideas, positive solutions to the world's problems, whether they come from the worlds of science, the environment, economists, or just the local council. The Guardian has, committed, has been committed to high quality journalism about the environment for many years. We have 10 dedicated environment reporters across the world, and we put threats to wildlife and global temperature rises on our home pages and our front pages just as often and with just as much impact as the latest political crisis. And our readers really read them. And I feel now, as the climate crisis is already with us, that we must, all of us, constantly challenge ourselves and ask if we're doing enough to highlight the urgency of the moment. So we've increased the size of our environment reporting team and we are finding that our readers are increasingly responsive to the journalism. We've carried the inspiration of Greta Thunberg, I mentioned earlier, and her fellow school climate strikers. In March, our coverage of the strikes included reports from the UK, the US, Australia, Thailand, Belgium, Sweden, Sweden, France, and Spain, with students writing and guest editing our opinion pages that day. And in April, we decided to publish the global carbon dioxide count on the weather page every day, 
Uh, it was a reader suggested this idea and we thought it was a really good idea. And then just last month, we announced changes to the Guardian's style guide to alter the way we write about the environment. We want to ensure that we're being scientifically precise while also communicating clearly with readers on this very important issue. It seemed to us that the phrase climate change sounds far too passive and gentle when what scientists are describing is a catastrophe for humanity. So from now on, we'll instead talk about a climate emergency, a climate crisis, or climate breakdown. We'll say global heating, not global warming. Fish populations, not fish stocks, because fish don't exist solely to feed us. And we'll write about climate change deniers, not skeptics, because in denial is what they are. Concern for my environment has also helped shape our coverage of travel, fashion, and how to eat. And it's changed our approach to packaging. The Saturday Guardian in print now comes in a compostable wrap made from potato starch, not a plastic bag. And readers love that change. Because readers like fresh ideas. And the climate emergency, like so, else, so much else that's happening now, calls for them. Our second principle is that these times demand greater collaboration with readers and with other partners and publishers too. The Guardian has collaborated with more than 100 different organizations over the last three years, putting aside competitiveness in favor of pursuing investigations in the public interest. Guardian journalists are part of the Forbidden Stories Project, for example, a network of journalists who vow to protect and publish the work of journalists who are threatened or killed around the world. And our investigative reporter, Juliette Garside, has had a particular role in continuing the work of murdered Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, alongside many others. And it was great to see that Forbidden Stories received a special award at the European Press Prize uh, in Warsaw last month. We were centrally involved in both the Panama and Paradise Papers projects with our friends at Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, which have had real consequences for tax avoiders globally. We also collaborate with readers and with marginalized communities. Just one example, in March last year, after a school shooting in the US, in which 17 students and teachers were killed at Marjorie Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida, The Guardian invited students from the school's magazine to come to our New York office to edit Guardian US, US with us for a day and to report from the student march against gun violence in DC. It was a really powerful way to hear their voices. My next principle is that our journalism should be meaningful. So, as I've discussed, these are serious times and we must put our heart and soul into covering what matters most. But meaningful journalism about every aspect of our lives, uh, of our readers' lives, also matters. Technology, science, fashion, sport and the arts, all of it has to be really high quality. Readers now want to be nourished, not fattened up with the junk food of clickbait. Everything we publish must matter. We publish one third fewer pieces now than we did three years ago, trying to be meaningful in everything we produce. We just want everything to be really good. We're no longer in an era of digital publishing when it meant that you just sort of flung up loads of stuff onto the website and see what happens. Uh, the fake news era, I believe, demands more precision. One most imp our most important principle on the list, um, however, is that we must report uh, fairly on people as well as power. Now, reporting is the bedrock of everything. It always has to be. It's crucial in a democracy, and it needs reporters to do it. It's hard for others to do it. Too many important stories get drive-by coverage when what they deserve is patient attention, forensic reporting which reveals injustice or gives voice to the silenced. News organizations must never deprioritize the vital skill of finding things out, getting to the facts, and reporting them clearly getting out of the office, and really, really listening to what people are saying to you. Now, we all know this can be time-consuming and expensive work, but that's what's getting to the heart of a story as complex as, say, the Windrush scandal in the UK requires. So Guardian reporter Amelia Gentleman spent months uncovering the fact that the British uh, citizens of Caribbean descent were being targeted for deportation by the government's hostile Im environment immigration policies, which were introduced uh, in the early 2010s. Amelia's reporting initially focused on the human cost of the hostile env environment policy. At the beginning, it was just one person's terrible story. We couldn't believe what had happened to this one person. 
But as time went on, we uncovered that thousands of black Britons had been denied health care, had lost their jobs, or even been deported to Jamaica, a country they may not have visited since they were a small child. The cumulative impact over many months of being ignored by the government finally led to a polit political scandal and the resignation of the Home Secretary. And the UK government has now apologized to the thousands of people affected and has set up a compensation scheme for them. From that one case study, six months later, we now believe that up to 30,000 people may apply for the compensation. Amelia's reporting changed Britain's policy on immigration and forced the Home Secretary to resign. So readers must also have reporting they can trust, and this comes in many forms. Two months ago, The Guardian announced a new technical switch that old news stories will be marked with their year of publication when shared on social media to limit the spread of uh, misinformation. We did it because partisan groups had been sharing old Guardian news stories as though they had just happened in order to push their agendas. So uh, the digital team did this in a couple of weeks, developed a new system, and we've had such a positive response from readers and journalists around the world. It's such a simple idea, but with such a big impact. And so many of us are looking for new ways to help good quality information flourish in the face of online fakes and frauds uh, supported by dark money spending. That idea was born out of a straightforward commitment to fairly reporting the facts. And if The Guardian can do it with our slim resources and our finances just getting back to sustainability, surely the world's technology companies could take similar steps to combat, combat fake news too. My final principle is to diversify. If we believe listening to people is important, then we must also be constantly thinking about how we make journalism more diverse and more inclusive of different voices. If we don't, we'll risk becoming ever more distant from people's lives. We will miss stories and we will drive mistrust in the media. Because people from different backgrounds have completely different perspectives on what makes news. And journalists should be part of the communities we report on, not floating above them. So at The Guardian, we've come a long way from May 1922, when The Guardian first published a women's page called Mainly for Women, although at the time, this was revolutionary. Many of the roles at The Guardian uh, that in the past were held by men are now held by women with innovative job shares and roles. We have a Westminster reporting team that is over 70% female, headed up by our brilliant political editor, Heather Stewart. And our Saturday paper features business, opinion, weekend review sections are also all edited by women. And our managing editor and our top lawyer are women as well. I think what is important is not just get women, women into top jobs, but getting diverse kinds of women into top jobs. And then making sure they have the structures and support to do their jobs in ways that open up space for issues that affect women and bring forward more women. So it'll be no surprise to any of you that I get a lot of scrutiny as the only female editor-in-chief of a national newspaper group in Britain. Just last month, a male columnist on the British magazine The New Statesman described The Guardian under my editorship as too feminized. Now, it was a load of sexist nonsense, so I decided to write a letter back, and if you'll just uh, allow me to read it to you. Peter Wilby complains that he finds The Guardian under my editorship overly feminized. Of course, as the only female editor-in-chief in Britain, I'm used to this kind of analysis. But I wonder what he means by feminized. If he means revealing the Windrush scandal, forcing a Home Secretary to resign, delivering record numbers of loyal digital readers alongside our highest ever print subscriptions, overseeing thriving editions in the US and, and Australia, and an exuberant observer that exposed the Cambridge Analytica scandal, being nominated for an Oscar, launching a highly successful daily news podcast, and getting The Guardian to break even for the first time since the 1990s, then perhaps being feminized isn't so bad. I have to say, I have to say, I've been editor for four years, and the PR advice whenever we get horrible press coverage is always rise above it, rise above it, it's beneath you. And it felt absolutely bloody brilliant uh, not to rise above it for once. <laughs> 
So as well as the five principles for Guardian journalism, we also have a sixth principle, which is to be financially sustainable. So when David Pemsel and I took over as CEO and Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian in the summer of 2015, we were presented with a dramatic set of commercial figures. Newsprint advertising was collapsing and growth in digital ad spend was going almost entirely to Facebook and Google. We realized that we were heading for a very big operating loss of over 80 million pounds. So as well as tackling costs rapidly, we had to find new ways to bring in revenue. In 2015, we had an existing membership scheme, but it was very small, just 12,000 members, with an offer based around events hosted in a new building in London. It was clear that a dramatic shift was needed and that membership should be much more embedded in Guardian journalism rather than something that felt like a brand extension and it needed to be global. So I appointed two senior journalists with backgrounds in understanding our readers' relationships with The Guardian and in political campaigning uh, to look at the issue. They put together a team made up of other journalists, UX researchers, designers, data analysts, engineers, marketing and product managers. And they discovered that while our existing members and subscribers prefer to support us through a regular payment and get something tangible in exchange, a lot of people didn't want anything. They just wanted to support The Guardian directly, got to support Guardian journalism directly, at a level and frequency they could dictate and they could afford. So through some experimentation, we started to ask people to give us money to fund our journalism, and the contributions model was born. Now, a similar approach to this is not unusual at smaller news organizations in the US, but globally, large newspaper institutions have tended to put up paywalls. In the UK, the idea of a media organization asking its readers for direct contributions was unheard of at the time. And I'll be honest with you, it really did not have much support inside The Guardian or outside uh, to begin with. One journalist kept stopping me in the corridor saying, I still don't understand. You give money, but what do you get? And some commercial colleagues were highly suspicious of something so uncommercial. Why would anyone pay for something? they could get for free. But the readers understood it. The uncertainty from colleagues stopped when they started to see the figures. In the last three years, The Guardian has received financial support from more than one million people, including print and digital subscribers, alongside hundreds of thousands of people who contribute because they believe in our mission and our purpose. We've also revamped our subscriptions, including our new premium app, and even our daily print subscriptions are at a record high. We've also relaunched Guardian Weekly, a 100-year-old uh, news, international news magazine you might be familiar with. It was, uh, we've made it into a glossy magazine when it previously was in print. It doesn't just mean more readers paying for Guardian journalism. It also means a huge group of people supporting The Guardian's purpose, sharing our journalism, helping us have impact. As a result of that support, we were able to announce last month in London that we have made a small operating profit for the first time in 20 years. So we now have our, our highest revenue for 10 years. We have our lowest costs for eight years. 55% of our revenues are now digital. And interestingly, 55% of our revenues are now from readers over advertisers. And despite declining sales at newsstand, we have record uh, print and uh, subscriptions and also record digital subscriptions. Just 8% of our revenue is now from print advertising. And we now have 650,000 people, it's more than that actually, who pay regularly for The Guardian, whether as print or digital subscribers or as regular contributors. Our businesses in the US and Australia, far from being loss making, are now thriving breaking stories locally, and profitable and sustainable in their own right. And of course, because The Guardian has no proprietor and no shareholders, that small profit is spent on more journalism. It's been a remarkable three years, particularly as we've done it while producing some of the world's biggest investigations. And we've now set ourselves a new ambitious goal for the next three years. We want to achieve two million paying supporters in 2022 by the end of The Guardian's 200th anniversary year, which is why we chose all those numbers with twos in. So The Guardian is thriving despite the turmoil around us. In the last 
few months, record numbers of people have visited our website, subscribed to or bought our newspaper, or contributed to our journalism. In March, 160 million browsers gave us 1.35 billion page views, with a particular increase in regular readers. At its core, that's because most people who work at The Guardian and most of our readers instinctively know who we are, what we stand for, and why we exist, and why, as so many people tell us, that is more important now than ever. But we've also seen the power of clearly articulating our purpose and its impact in the world, and ensuring that we build the foundations for a guardian that can best face the challenges of our times. Thank you. I think we've got some questions. Wow, um, I've got so many questions. We've got some time, should we go and have a seat? Um, the microphones are coming round, but I have the microphone, so I'm going to go first, if that's all right. I've got so many questions. There are a bunch of things you said. One, one of the things that I was curious about is you said you were publishing less. Now, obviously, Guardian is very mission-driven, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how, how you decide what you publish, because what's right to publish versus what's getting read the most. Could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I think it's... Um, Sorry, yeah, let's give you a mic. Mic number two, yes. yes. So I think um, it's a bit of a myth to think um, that there are all these worthy, important stories that don't get an audience. Basically, um, when you look, when we looked, and when we originally started this project, and we looked at uh, the articles got the, that got the smallest audience, the least traffic, and I wasn't surprised by anything on that list. Oh, really? It was all things that you shouldn't really be publishing. Okay. <laughs> You know, it was incremental stories, it was boring stories, it was, it was bits of agency that, um, we were, you know, it, I don't know why we're running nearly all of it. So, you know, and I think the truth is, if there is a imp really important story that it's not getting much of an audience, then it's our responsibility to find it an audience. And, and, it's, and you can do that. You know, you can do that with where you promote it on the homepage, with the headline, with where you put it on social channels. So it's absolutely our responsibility to get an audience. You might not get a huge audience, a, st a story that's, that's difficult but important, but you can always get a decent audience. And so yeah. the third we cut, I mean, I've not had a single complaint from a reader about anything we've cut. Nobody's noticed. That's, that's um, all that's happened is that they're reading more of the good stories and the traffic's gone up. So, you know, less is more. Amazing. That's fantastic. Now, we should have some microphones floating around. Are there any burning questions from the audience at all? We've got a hand up just here, if we could get a microphone. And if you could introduce yourself and where you're from before you ask your question, please. Hi, okay, Kath. It's uh, Phil Chetwin. I'm the Global News Director of AFP. Um, I'm really into, I mean, I think what, what you've done at The Guardian is amazing with the, with the membership scheme and, and, and everyone in in our organization has been following that very closely. I'm really interested in how that's impacting your journalism, uh, how having this sort of huge mass of people who are very involved with what you're doing, who feel a connection to what you're doing, how's that influencing your journalism? You referenced a couple of times, the reader had given you an idea, but how do you capture that and, and how has it changed your journalism? I mean, it's a good question and I think it's an ongoing issue because, um, Generally, it's been very positive. You know, our readers, uh, I, d I wasn't in my speech, but there's an interesting uh, fact about the uh, contributions numbers is that when we started it, it was with a slightly panicky, you know, help, help, give us some money. And that did pretty well. But now we're saying, come and give money. We've got a million other people doing it. It's working. This model is working. We, it, that's much more successful than the negative message was and so readers feel that they want to be helping us giving us ideas and so the Id that's why you know the idea of the carbon dioxide I thought it was a fantastic idea but you're right the difficulty is in capturing them and, and, and I think you know readers often make suggestions for our journalism and you know we're free to take them or not I know some people get very concerned with these kind of models that they're suddenly going to be um, you know doing things they don't want to do editorially. But that's just not been my experience. My experience is that readers really want to help you in, in positive, creative ways. I wouldn't say we're necessarily so great at capturing them yet, though. That's something we're working on. Um, I mean, the other thing we do, we also know every story, um, the last thing that someone read before they gave money. 
uh, which is very interesting because it's not necessarily a, a proxy. It, you, we're taking it as a proxy for what helps people decide to become a contributor, uh, which obviously might not be the whole story. It might be they've been very inspired by the 10 previous articles. Um, but when we do that, you know, it's our most serious stuff. It's the big investigations, it's the coverage of the environment, uh, it's international reporting, it's the most serious stuff. And so our readers are really contributing to something that's meaningful. And the New York Times have taken a bit of a leaf out of your book recently. Everyone's taken a leaf out of our <laughs> book. We've seen everyone using our language, and that's great because we did all the hard work. That's great. Very happy to help the industry. <laughs> well, as the industry, thank you very much for that. It's been great. I think we've got another question. Yeah. Have the microphone, that's why. Okay, Dimitris Malas from CNN Greece. Uh, would you think that if you haven't made all these changes in the journalism that you provided, which was a very good move and something that most of us would like also to do at some, some point, uh, do you think that if you haven't done that, the contributions wouldn't be as much? Do you believe that if you haven't provided such a good journalism, such good articles, such a better quality, that the contributions wouldn't be one million but will be half a million, something like that. I think, I mean, we have a lot of readers around the world who just love The Guardian and always have. But obviously, the, the, the kind of stories we do are what give people the impetus to give money right there, right now. Um, and so I think th they definitely work together. And big stories lead to contributions. Important stories lead to contributions. And so doing the sort of most valuable journalism in the, in the public interest it seems to be uh, what inspires readers the most. So yeah, the more stories, the better, I think, on all levels. Could you talk about how much people give? Is there an average donation amount? And if you've been looking at what's the last article, yeah. does that make a difference? I mean, it's a very, very, very data-driven um, uh, um, product membership. I mean, we absolutely test all of our messaging. Um, and it's quite interesting how the different messages perform differently in different territories. Um, so independence is a very powerful message all around the world, but it's particularly powerful in Australia, where 70% of the media is owned by Rupert Murdoch, and so they obviously value independence, uh, particularly in Australia. So um, we do know a lot, you know, we, we do a know a lot about why people give money. In terms of the average, it changes all the time, and we, we haven't gone public with that. It changes all the time, it's different for different territories, it's different at different moments. Okay, perfect, thank you. And we've got a microphone up here. Hi there, my name is Farhan Malik and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, share with you that I'm a regular reader of Guardian and uh, uh, I have a little story to share with that because when Panama Papers story broke, uh, it was from a German newspaper. And my guys tweet, uh, shared tweets with me about that story. And since I was subscribed to Guardian, I could see that this story was being taken up by Guardian as well. So that helped me break that story first before any other channel in Pakistan. And uh, it was because it's of that. Big story in Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and we got the current Prime Minister Imran Khan on our uh, channel as well because of that advantage. But my questions are regarding two other things. Uh, number one, what part of the surge, I'm sure you guys have done a tremendous job, I, I read all your articles regularly. What part of this surge that you're seeing is post-Brexit? I mean, post this uh, uh, wave of ultra-nationalism that we have seen all over the world, from Brazil to UK to US to India. Uh, and another question on more um, macro level, uh, don't you think, I mean, I personally, agree with a lot of things that uh, New York Times or Guardian does. But don't you think on a macro level, it in a way is not helping this whole polarization thing that we are seeing all over the world and it is further putting us poles apart. I mean, uh, a small example would be when how frequently New York Times calls Trump a liar. But for, for somebody to be called a liar, you need to know that he knew otherwise. But, but newspapers regularly do these things and you're saying that it's not helping the overall geopolitical nationalist wave um, all over the world. So wh what do you have to say about that? Thank you. Um, so it's on, on Brexit, uh, I mean, certainly uh, the big Brexit days give us a very, very big audience. And uh, I mentioned that the uh, readership within the EU has dramatically gone up. And that's because, as uh, all of our European friends tell us, that they really like our calm, sensible Brexit reporting that's nonetheless uh, also, you know, positive about Europe rather than uh, most of the rest of the news organisations in Britain. So, I mean, and all of these things are good for audiences and, and 
of course, good for traffic. But they're also, you know, they're bad for uh, the commercial, you know, Brexit is not good for the commercial side of the business. So I think, you know, net net, I don't know where we left. So I think um, all I can say is that, you know, we need to try, when you have big stories, it's not a given that you just get the audience. You have to go out and uh, give them what they need and give them good reporting. So I think you just have to rise to those occasions when they happen. Um, in terms of polarisation, I think that is a risk, yes. And, I, and as I mentioned in my speech, that we're trying to avoid polarisation within The Guardian. You know, I always say that no one, should no one can agree with everything that's published in The Guardian opinion pages. I certainly don't. Um, and so it's really important that we have a diversity of views. And I think it's also an another reason, by the way, um, and I don't think I mentioned this in my speech, actually, that, it's, that, that we feel it's really important that The Guardian stays free. Um, our readers told us when we, um, when, we, uh, when we did contributions initially, we asked readers to tell us why they were giving us money. And the overwhelming reason, I mean, the, the, the biggest one was distinctive reporting and investigative reporting and so on. But then the reason that surprised us and was from a huge number of uh, contributors was that they were giving us money because they could afford to and they want us to stay free for people who couldn't afford to. Um, and I think, you know, considering that most of the news organizations around the world are right-leaning and are owned by people who want to get rich or have political influence, usually from the right, then to try and keep progressive gu uh, Guardian journalism open to all is a really important way of trying to um, offset or balance that. You talked a little bit, sorry, following up on that and the polarization, because this really speaks to the Reuters Institute as well, where they were saying this, the, the, the viewers have gone, uh, Sorry, I'm going to do this vast injustice. But with the, particularly the, the fake news, where liberal trust news a lot more and sort of the more conservative have got far less trust. One of the things you talked about was having opposing views within The Guardian. How do you handle that? Do you have opinion pieces that your readers won't necessarily like? Does, does that not feel a bit, ah, sometimes? <laughs> well, it's within limits. I mean, you know, we don't run articles from the far right. We don't. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't do that. Um, I, I mean, but we do. I do think there's a very broad array of opinion that can be classed as a Guardian opinion. Um, I read a great comment from the beginning of the 20th century uh, from a Guardian editor way back then, and uh, he said the Guardian has always been a debate between the centre and the left. And I thought that's actually a really great, great way of describing what I think we need to be in this moment because. Uh, Economically, uh, so much of the world obviously is moving to the left. Left neoliberalism has proved to uh, uh, has gone to, has clearly gone too far, um, and so. Uh, but we can't just do that perspective alone because I think you know we have to have um, an array of opinions. I mean, there are lots of cultural issues. There are a spread of opinions that are of both of the left, and I think we have to try and represent both. Um, I think it's against the grain. I have to say, I think. Um, opinion generally is moving towards being much more polarized. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd, say, I'd say I'd do it, but within limits. Yeah, because it's kind of tough, right? Because you need to show opposing views, because if you go too much down the middle, it just becomes a bit bland. Yeah, I agree. Super. Have we got I a microphone, microphone ready? I grabbed a microphone. Hi. And then we'll get I'm one Italian lover from Kuda's story. My question is actually uh, very much linked to, the last, to Jody's last question. Um, and um, I'm very curious, but there's such, well, thank you, first of all, for giving us a leaf from your book to take, because uh, it's a very inspiring uh, lesson and the transformation has been amazing. Um, but um, there's such hype around the membership programs in the industry in general, you know, everyone, everyone's launching me membership programs and so on. I wonder how much have you thought, especially with the Guardian's experience where your membership really skyrocketed through the Assange Snowden um, Wiki, uh, WikiLeaks stories, right? I wonder how much um, uh, ha have you thought and about the way that it affects the membership, affects the editorial process, and whether you've put any safeguards in place and whether it's just something that you think about uh, in the newsroom because um, you know I don't think this is something that we talk about when we talk about membership programs is kind of the the we pressure of of the members yeah we actually didn't have a membership scheme during the WikiLeaks uh, membership scheme was only launched uh, I think four years ago and then we changed it to a contribution scheme three years ago and WikiLeaks was 
way before that. So, um, but it does it does spike around big investigations, particularly investigations of our own. Um, so, uh, or interesting moments. Uh, there's, you know, when uh, with the Cambridge Analytica story, when Facebook sent us a legal letter to try to stop us publishing it, and we went public with that, that led to a very big <laughs> spike in membership. So I think um, it's a feeling, whenever people, and if people feel that news organizations are under pressure or under stress, that's a big moment. But as I say, our, our biggest ever moment was when we announced that we had a million people supporting us, and so people wanted to join that bandwagon. Um, so I think it's lots of different things that drive membership spikes. Um, and, you know, if there's pressure to produce big exclusives and big stories, well, there should be pressure to produce those anyway. You know, stories in the public interest are valuable, whether they bring in contributions or not. That's the re they're the reason we exist. Thank you. I think there are a couple of questions down here. Do we have a microphone down here? Yeah. Oh, you've got it. Amazing. I've got it. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Nicolas Panagiotou from Aristotle University of Greece. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, speech. I would like actually to ask you the following. Do you think that uh, press or digital, is it still valid as a question for Guardian? And based on what you ha have actually described, so many people from all around the world going in favor of the digital uh, subscription, et cetera. Do you think that it's still valid, this question, or? Is, is what still valid, sorry? Whether you would continue to be uh, on print or digital. Oh, I see, yes. Um, I mean, we, we try and think about it in terms of sort of, you know, we're not print first, we're not digital first, we're just journalism first. We start with the stories and then uh, you know, the platform comes later. I mean, I think, and what's been surprised, I didn't mention very much in the speech, but Guardian Weekly, this was a 100-year-old newspaper. You might know it because you're in Greece, but this is an international newspaper. Um, I always joke it was invented in 1919 and it hasn't been touched since then. So uh, last year we uh, reinvented it as a glossy, full-color mag news magazine. Um, and it's been a really, really successful uh, relaunch, particularly with people under 40, which we never expected to see with a print product. That wasn't the intention of it. Um, and so I, I, I guess I sort of think, you know, j daily newspaper sales are still going down everywhere, but print per se uh, is not. Um, and so I think the way to do it is just to think about, you know, what's, what's the best platform for our readers for these stories? Are there different readers we can hit in different ways digitally and in print and just sort of approach it like that rather than having this kind of binary one or the other. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Who has got the microphone? Me. <laughs> this chap here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Germán García. I'm from Alice Production. My question is um, about video. Um, so we've seen um, the video of the day section of in, in The Guardian. You show their documentaries, news, even sports, great content. So my question is whether you have a special strategy for video, especially bearing in mind the 5G revolution is about to happen, and whether you oversee good monetization possibilities for it, especially bearing in mind the excellent economic results you had in 2018, 2019. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so um, it's been a tricky it, question for a long time, hasn't it? We know our readers like it, but just know how to pay for it. Um, what we found, uh, you know, straightforwardly, the sort of evidential news video is a good thing to do in a news story. We like doing explanatory videos where we contextualize the story and help somebody understand it. Um, what we've started to do uh, in the last couple of years uh, uh, is uh, documentaries um, and with particular um, focus on the short docs and that's how we got the Oscar nomination. Thank you for letting me mention it again. Uh, for Black Sheep, do have a look. It's on the website. Didn't win, but it was a nice party. Anyway, um, so, uh, so documentaries and we've also just uh, released a, a feature documentary called Seahorse which premiered at Tribeca. Um, which is a fantastic 90-minute documentary as well. So we're trying to hit on all different levels, and then of course, you know, where, and, and, and shareable videos as well in the right uh, social context. So, um, but I would, I mean, we're still working on it. I think it's making more money than it used to, but I still, do, I still think that question about how to monetize it is a big challenge. Sorry. 
Catherine, thank you so much. I wish we had longer. I feel I've got another 20 questions that I could happily go through, and I'm sure you guys do too. But um, we've got some more excellent speakers lined up, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But Catherine, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs>